March 20, 2003, thousands of troops of the U.S.-led coalition began to pour across Kuwait's border with Iraq and head towards Baghdad. Within 20 days, they had arrived in the capital and broken Saddam Hussein's regime. The world saw the progress of Operation Iraqi Freedom as a triumph of technological might that soon overwhelmed the Iraqi forces. But there is another story of hard-fought, nasty street battles that wrought death and destruction on both sides. 152 coalition troops died during the push for Baghdad. The number of Iraqi dead is unknown, but estimates run in the thousands. It was inch by inch, foot by foot, just like it has always been, World War II, World War I. I thought it was gonna be all like brave, like Marines or whatever. I was scared to death. They were putting bayonets in folks. What I've seen, people's legs and other people's laps. It changes all forever. Using new footage and specially created combat graphics, this program tells of key battles that shaped the war. Someone's gonna have to argue with me pretty hard that uh, anybody since uh, Vietnam fighting the North Vietnamese has confronted an enemy that was this determined. This is the story of the war's crucial turning points. They went crazy pulling the statue down, beating it with the soles of their shoes, which is one of the biggest disgraces, I guess, that they can bestow upon a person. A war fought with a ferocity, which helps explain why this is a battle that isn't over. This is the home from home of the U.S. Army's 270 Armor Battalion, a former Iraqi military compound in Abu Ghraib in western Baghdad. 270 are part of 150,000 coalition forces trying to keep the peace in Iraq. Now we're leaving the, uh, the 270 compound. We're going to go out on our patrol, out into the wilderness, Indian country. It means that there's bad guys out there. They just keep us guessing. We could be driving down the road right now, and, and we could be engaged by AK fire. It's, it's just anybody's guess. More US troops have been killed in peacekeeping operations than during the combat phase of the war, many of them victims of roadside bombs. There have been several along this road. They can be disguised as a trash bag, a Coke can. They've put some explosives in a dead animal carcass because they know that we might just drive over them. The high-risk area is the market in Abu Ghraib. The market's pretty bad. Apparently, it's one of the worst in Baghdad. We used to get a lot of thumbs up signs from people when we drove to the market. Now we don't. Staff Sergeant Christopher Kahunsky and the rest of 270 were part of Operation Iraqi Freedom. They crossed the Kuwaiti border on March 20th, 2003, fought their way to Baghdad, and a year later, were still there. It's a surprise because you know, we initially thought that if we fought the war, that we would go home with the mission accomplished. Job done. You know, President Bush landed on the aircraft carrier and he said, Major, Major Brown combat's over. And everybody cheered and there were welcome home banners and job well done banners. And uh, we're still here and we're still losing soldiers. This is how the world saw the start of the war. Before dawn on March 20th, Precision bombs began to strike regime targets in Baghdad in a campaign designed to shock and awe. For the combat troops in Kuwait, 300 miles away, it was different. Cannoneers of 111 Marines were given the order to launch the first artillery barrage into Iraq and start the ground war. It was uh, exhilarating. A lot of booms, you know. 
flashes of light. It was all it was all dark, so you couldn't really see anything. Your hands start shaking, but your mind keeps working. It was a huge adrenaline rush, but at the same time, it's almost like it was unreal, like it wasn't happening. United States Marines were the first to cross the border. One of their objectives was to seize oil fields in the south. They were crammed into amphibious assault vehicles known as AAVs or tracks. It was like riding in a sardine can. They packed us Marines in here really tight with all our gear, our ammunition. It was unbearable, but we had to suck it up. We're Marines. All you see is tracer rounds from Patriots and everything going overhead, and you know, the whole sky's lit up like Fourth of July. The sun was just coming up, and just hearing those thunderous explosions, that's when I realized, wow, I'm going to war. The army followed out into the desert. 19,000 troops and some 10,000 vehicles, including the world's fastest and most powerful battle tank, the M1A1 Abrams. I think the first road trip we actually took was 26 hours. And we uh, rotated through actually sleeping and commanding the tank, because it's an awful long time to drive straight through. I think the army purposely engineers army vehicles to be uncomfortable, because whenever you try to sleep in them, there, there's always a jagged edge or a pointy object in some place where your head would fit just perfectly. A lot of vibrations, a lot of getting bumped around, trying to get comfortable in a very uncomfortable environment. The war had one aim, to take Baghdad without delay. The army would take the desert route from Kuwait, attacking Baghdad from the southwest. Leading the way was the 3rd Infantry Division, commanded by Major General Buford Blunt. We had identified Baghdad as a center of gravity. We knew we had it, needed to get to Baghdad and, uh, and take the regime out. And so we really didn't want to get bogged down in all the cities going up to Baghdad. That's one reason I tried to stay out to the west in the, in the desert. There really were no large, major military forces in the cities. They were outside the cities. The Marines would take the roads and attack Baghdad from the southeast. And so we were there to create that dilemma for the enemy that he was being attacked on two frontages and he would have to deal with significant combat power, both coming from the southeast and coming from the south. The coalition enjoyed overwhelming air superiority. But to win the war, their troops would need to seize ground from 200,000 Iraqi fighters who outnumbered them by two to one. Once we went across that burn with Alpha Troop and started hearing them fit the cars go off and the tanks going off and the brawlers going off, reality set in. Buddy, we are at war, whether you realize it or not. So you got to do whatever you, you got to do to get home. During the first two days of the war, the British with U.S. Marines took the port of Umkasar and headed north to surround Iraq's second city, Basra. U.S. Marines then bypassed Basra and approached the city of Nazaria. To open a southeastern route to Baghdad, they had to capture intact two important bridges in the city, the southern Euphrates Bridge and the northern bridge over the Saddam Canal. But on the outskirts of Nazaria, they discovered an army convoy which had been ambushed by enemy forces. The vehicles were in flames. Several soldiers were missing. One of them, a young private, called Jessica Lynch. At that point, I turned to the regimental commander and the, the battalion commander, and I said, we have to accelerate the attack. Uh, we have to find those missing soldiers, and we need to get those bridges before they're blown. Natonsky brought forward the attack on the bridges by 24 hours. Bravo Company 1-2 Marines would take the northern bridge by going round to the east to avoid an urban battle. Alpha Company would take the Euphrates Bridge, and Charlie Company would follow Bravo to the Northern Canal Bridge. Intelligence foresaw no difficulty with the terrain or the Iraqis. 
They expected mass surrenders from the Republican Guard and inept fighting from Fedayeen troops and Ba'ath Party militias. But it would not go as planned. The initial intelligence analysis basically said that uh, there might be some minor resistance, but then we expected the enemy to pull out and, uh, and leave the city. With respect to the terrain, uh, we, we had photos, we had maps of the city. We pretty much knew uh, what the terrain was like and what the uh, construction of the, uh, the buildings were. However, we had not factored in the fact uh, that it had rained several days earlier. We can now build up a picture of what happened on the Nazaria battlefield that day. I remember as we were approaching the city of al Nazaria, there was a sign in English that said, welcome. When I saw a sign that says, welcome in English, I became very suspicious. On the morning of the 23rd of March, according to plan, Bravo took the lead, crossing the Euphrates Bridge. As soon as Bravo moved round to the east, they started to receive fire. Their heavy vehicles ran into soft, muddy ground and began to get stuck fast. You're gonna hear the cry from, from the crew members. We can't move, we can't move, we're stuck. We're stuck, we can't move, we can't move. And you know, next thing you know, they're up, you know, the mud's up above their turn, um, almost you know, at their turn. To see one of our vehicles being immobile because of the soil sent an impulse of panic throughout the entire um, company. To use a, an oft-used term, Murphy's Law was playing hell with us at this point. Uh, everything that could go wrong was going wrong. Rushed into the attack and stuck fast, the Marines now discovered that their radios would not work. They had no communications. We had some difficulty with, with Con for a couple of reasons. I think for the battalion, it was our, really our first experience with combat, and uh, there were a lot of people trying to talk over each other on the radio, which didn't help. Did we get a com check? Alpha Company, meanwhile, followed Bravo in their AAVs. But just as they got to the Euphrates Bridge, they too were caught in a firefight. And the next thing you know, we hear rounds just whiz past our heads coming from behind us. We can see rounds impacting on the berm, like just a couple feet away from us. I mean, it might sound kind of weird or sadistic, but we actually thought it was kind of funny. We just dropped down and started rolling down and just laughing about it. It was like a game. It looked like a game, but we were in it. And it went for us so fast that when we looked at each other and we realized that we were moving, we've been fighting for hours. I compare it to a dimmer switch, and uh, the longer we were there, the dimmer switch kept getting turned up. I was very concerned that it was only a matter of time till we started taking some casualties. Charlie Company, whose tanks were refueling after rescuing some soldiers from the army convoy of Jessica Lynch, crossed the Euphrates. But instead of following Bravo, they went straight up what became known as Ambush Alley. Bravo Company, unbeknownst to me at that point, was bogged down in mud and everything else that was inside the city. And basically, we were supposed to go around to the eastern side of the city to secure the northern bridge but uh, we ended up going straight up uh, what they're calling Ambush Alley. In their lightly armored tracks, Charlie ran the gauntlet of automatic fire and RPGs, rocket-propelled grenades, fired by hundreds of Iraqis seeking another victory, like the one they had scored against the Army convoy that morning. We took heavy fire the whole way. It seemed like the further we got north, the more the fire picked up. Um, small arms, some machine guns, some RPG fire. Vehicles in front of the column were reporting 
people running across the roads, firing at the column. I couldn't even relay to uh, my lieutenant what was going on fast enough. It was just everything was evolving so fast. I saw numerous RPG shots at my vehicle and the vehicle behind me. I'm guessing six or seven hits we took. Towards the end of Ambush Alley, we actually ran over somebody. And, like, he got caught in our tracks. It was kind of surreal, like, to see people actually, like, falling. One of the last tracks was torn open by a rocket-propelled grenade. Inside the track, it was chaos. I heard, uh, you know, people donning gas masks. The whole track was filled with black smoke. We didn't know where it was coming from. People screaming. I was trying to get out to get some air because I was choking on the smoke. People ran to the vehicle and uh, unlocked the back doors, and people poured out. Um, there, was some, there was some significant casualties from the back, some severe leg wounds. The initial hit from the RPG <clears throat> left me blind for about, I'd say, it was, I think it was an hour, hour and a half, I couldn't see nothing. It was kind of, everything was hazy, real foggy. And what I seen, it, it was just, you know, people's legs and other people's laps. Under increasingly intense fire, Charlie made it to the Northern Bridge and began to defend it. The drama that unfolded was captured by a photographer embedded with Charlie Company. I knew we needed to do something, be it move or, or spread out or tack to the north, try to do something to get out of the way of this, uh, what had turned into an, a kill sack for the enemy's artillery. Probably within a half an hour we had, uh, our mortars were up firing and one of our mortar tubes was hit directly by either an RPG or, or a uh, artillery round and we had the uh, first Marines that were killed. I remember uh, Lieutenant uh, Reed, which was uh, one of the lieutenants I rode on my track. I remember him, you know, just coming to the back of my vehicle, you know, just bleeding from like every orifice of his face. I was like, oh God, you know? And he was, he was like the first like person that I saw that was just like tore up. When you start hearing all these guys screaming and uh, moaning and you know, yelling out and that's when you know and I remember looking back and I saw Doc Robinson you know running around doing his thing and I was just lining these guys up. It made my heart jump into my throat seeing them down there and seeing them hurt but I got to push that aside do your job. I mean there'd be time to grieve later on feel sorry for him later on but now it's, it's time to time to act not time to cry. They were in bad shape. A couple of amputees literally guys holding other guys' legs. You're taught that there's a golden hour that you can get those guys out of there. And we were, and with some of these guys, we were past that hour. While most of Charlie stayed to secure the Northern Bridge, a convoy of five tracks sped back down Ambush Alley to evacuate the casualties. Minutes after setting off, one of the tracks was hit. As we were going over the bridge, it was just a huge explosion. I don't know where it came from. I don't know what it was. All I know is it just rocked the whole vehicle. After that, it was, it, it was all black for like about two minutes. I remember yelling back and telling guys to get out. I, at this time, I didn't know that I had lost everybody in the back. It was just a big fireball. It was maybe 25 meters in front of us. It was uh, body parts came out of the vehicle. Uh, it was like there was nothing left. There's no way anybody could have lived off of it. Moments later, Sergeant Schaefer's track packed with Marines was also hit. I felt heat coming up through the turret, and we lost our steering. We crashed into the building. I did look over, and there was hundreds of Iraqis just running at us. And uh, that's when I was like, everybody just get, get out. As soon as the track like stopped, it just all the small arms fired, concentrated on that. You could tell, the, I could hear the rest of the tracks going off in the distance. So I knew we were alone. We didn't know like what was going on. We didn't even actually know where we were. We were kind of disorientated. Marines escaping the burning vehicles found themselves caught in the firestorm of Ambush Alley with no cover. Saw a little alleyway with a pretty high wall behind it. And when everybody just started piling up behind that wall. We sat there for a while and we were like, we, we got to get into a place with better cover. That's uh, pretty much when we decided just 
We gotta get into these houses next to us. Doesn't matter how, just get us in there. We just got the casualties into the house. And we figured we'd just hold up there until we get some help. One of the convoy tracks damaged in Ambush Alley sped back to Alpha's position on the Euphrates Bridge. And that's when a uh, rock propeller grenade hit it again. And we knew automatically that there were going to be mass casualties because the way it actually jumped off the ground when it was hit and just dropped and it stopped moving. When the, when the ramp rolled down, just a leg rolled off of it and that the inside was pretty much uh, just a mesh of, of parts and, and whole people. If the wounded were to survive, they needed to be evacuated by helicopter. I looked at the road, there was, uh, there's power lines on either side of it, it's pretty tight. So directly across from the road, there was an alleyway. Now it was still pretty narrow, but definitely enough room for the 46. So we just came in and set it down right there. I just got goosebumps watching it. And then I got a sick feeling in my stomach, thinking that uh, it was only a matter of seconds till they destroyed that helicopter. The fighting had been going on for nearly three hours. It was most intense at Charlie's position, still isolated and trying to hold on to the northern bridge. Bravo was still stuck in the mud on the eastern side of Ambush Alley. And Alpha was under intense fire at the Euphrates Bridge. As the day went on and the fighting up on the northern bridge started to intensify. It's off, that was off. There we came into a little bit of fog of war. We knew there was a big fight on, but uh, uh, it was very difficult to get uh, true clarity on exactly the number of our casualties. At the north end of Ambush Alley, Marines from Charlie were still holed up in the house surrounded by Iraqi fighters. We thought we were from the beginning because like our lieutenant wasn't there, staff sergeant wasn't there. Just it was pretty much uh, a squad mentality, pretty much. It was just like pretty much we have to take care of our own. I was scared to death, like in the beginning it was like we're all confident, yeah, these guys we're winning, we're winning. As soon as you start seeing the first guys like get hit, it, it's sinking feeling like we might not make it. It was more scared. I, I wanted to go home, like I ain't gonna lie. I don't care. You can put the bravest guy in that situation. I think he'll just he'll 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 break down and he'll be scared also. We experienced it and yeah, it changed us all forever. With no radio communications or orders from higher up, Alpha at the Euphrates Bridge decided to act. I began to realize that uh, the longer we sat there, probably the more dire the situation would be. Dan Whitnam is the company commander for Charlie Company, and I thought, uh, Dan's in trouble, and he needs help. I realized that the time was coming to make a decision, because I was not going to stand by idly and allow Charlie Company to get chopped up or take further casualties when I could be in a position to, to assist them. Captain Brooks ordered Alpha Company to roll down Ambush Alley to help Charlie at the Northern Bridge. Marines from Charlie Company, still trapped inside the house, heard the approaching convoy. Once we see them, we're waving at them. They opened a fire on us because they, I mean, they saw we had weapons, you know, we were waving our weapons, which is probably a stupid mistake. Luckily, they didn't hit nobody. It was pretty, like, we got some communication by waving at them or whatever. Loading up the Marines from the house, the convoy, led by the tanks, continued up Ambush Alley onto the northern bridge. It was a uh, complete amount of relief. There was two tanks that came over first, and uh, I was able to jump on the tank and say, I need you to put a a tank ground in this house, this house, and this house, which is exactly where they were firing from the rooftops. You're up there for a couple hours wondering, wondering what's going to happen and why doesn't anyone know where we are, and then you keep hoping that the tanks are going to come over the bridge and 
reinforce your position. And uh, when they finally do, it was, it was something I'm not going to forget. And almost as soon as those tanks pushed over the bridge, it was silent. The mortar fire that we were taking, the heavy machine gun fire, the RPGs, it all, it all stopped. Uh, that, was, that was one of the best things I've seen all day. It's just great to see them. It was just a little more security, a little more fire, firepower for us. As evening fell, the battalion moved north of Nazaria to reorganize and care for the wounded. You could tell they fought hard. Uh, I got it to Dan Whitnam. He had blood all over him. A lot of the Marines had blood all over them from, from other Marines. Uh, they were cut. They were beat up. It's just hard looking at them. It was hell on earth. We were taking a beating down there. That something was going on that we just couldn't handle. That day, I was scared. And I was also fearful that it was going to happen every day for the next couple of days, at least weeks, months, years, and that it was, uh, was going to happen pretty much all over Iraq. There was a Humvee load full of just parts, just unidentified uh, body parts. We had to preserve the body parts so that we could get the DNA from them and find out who they were. And there were guards placed on there to keep, the, to keep birds and dogs from eating them. The Americans had come up against opponents that were not in the battle plan. Large numbers of determined Fedayeen troops and Ba'ath Party militia who were loyal to Saddam and prepared to fight to the death. It's the resistance they are still fighting today. I think we, we underestimated their, their willingness to fight on the part of the Fedayeen. There are questions we had at the battalion and company level that we never had answered. There's a lot of things I would have liked to know more about. You know, the result was we, we ended up doing things the way we did them. You know, hindsight being 2020, there's things we certainly would have done differently. The Marines took and kept those bridges that day, but at a terrible cost. 18 Marines from Charlie Company died, the biggest single U.S. loss during the war. Kevlar helmets and body armor saved many others, but couldn't prevent horrific injuries. My left leg's fine. I had one piece of shrapnel they thought was in my ankle joint, which uh, they kind of somehow moved without doing surgery. I don't know how they did it. But uh, as far as my right side, nerve damage, um, you know, I, I got screws in my, that run through my femur into my pelvis. My left backside, it, it's completely gone. You know, I, I walk with a limp. Doctor said it'll probably be a permanent limp, more than likely probably for the rest of my life. Th their comment was that they could get me back to living a normal life, but they can't get me back to staying, you know, with the rigors that the Marine Corps demands, which, you know, I, I, I'm still trying to prove them wrong from that. There isn't a day that has passed since or will it for the rest of my life that I don't think about the potential that those Marines had and uh, regret that I feel and the company feels, I think as a whole, that we weren't able to bring everyone back. Their mission was to capture those bridges. They knew that's what they had to accomplish and at the end of the day, not only had they rescued 10 American soldiers that had been ambushed earlier in the day, but they had captured both the bridges and they had opened the door to Baghdad through on Nasiriya. In the desert, the soldiers of the Army's 3rd Infantry Division moved from the southwest steadily towards Baghdad. In reality, we stayed pretty close to our plan start to finish. We didn't have a timetable on it. Not every movement went perfectly and we had to adjust based on the, the situation. One of the Army units on the move through the desert was 270 Armor. On March 25th, five days into the war, it was ambushed by the worst desert weather for a generation. I looked off to the right 
and I saw this enormous uh, wall coming at us, an orange wall. I looked over at my loader, made a real loud gasping noise. His eyes got real big. And I believe his words were, holy I looked back in the direction behind me that he was looking at, and I saw a wall of sand, a wall of red sand moving across the desert. It must have been several hundred feet high. And the guys in the vehicle were like, oh, look at that, that's cool. I go, roll up the windows right now. And about a minute later, that, that wall just slammed into us. I turned back to slam my hatch, and I was nearly blown out of the turret by the force of the wind and the sand as it hit me. It's nothing like anything I'd ever experienced. It was the most eerie feeling that uh, I think I've ever had. After 48 hours, the sandstorm lifted and the army continued their push north. To reach Baghdad, they had to pass through the Karbala Gap, a 10-kilometer bottleneck of open ground between a lake and the built-up area on the southwestern approach to the Iraqi capital. As we put together our plan, I realized that was a, a choke point that we would have to move through. And so it was a key piece of uh, terrain that uh, enabling the division to get up towards Baghdad, we would have to seize and control. And it, the fact that it narrowed down to uh, basically one uh, two roads going through the gap, uh, we would be very targetable there. The area south of Baghdad, including the Gap, was guarded by several divisions of Republican Guard. Blunt first sent in waves of attack aircraft, jets, and helicopters to inflict as much damage as possible. Then, to draw Iraqi reinforcements away from the Karbala Gap, he planned a feint a diversion or bogus advance towards al Hilah. We intended to try to keep him guessing as to where we were going to come uh, towards Baghdad from. Was it going to be in the south or were we going to stay to the west? And so we continually uh, made crossings across the Euphrates um, to uh, partly demonstrate that we had that capability that we might still come from the south. Another purpose was to try to uh, identify his artillery, try to make it move or shoot, and then we could uh, action against that. 270 Armour was tasked okay. with carrying out the feint. On the way, they saw the result of overwhelming coalition air power. When we were driving around Kiffel, that's where we saw the, the most dead bodies and carnage. We saw a lot of trucks, a lot of vehicles that were on a road or highway that had been destroyed on that road uh, from the air. And we saw lots of, uh, lots of death. So lots of uh, children, lots of adults, uh, lots of body parts. It was starting to sink in. I know that was the first time for a lot of people uh, that they had seen what military power can do to a human being in the flesh. Reinforced by light infantry from the 101st Airborne Division, 270 Armour prepared for what was expected to be a sideshow. The initial briefing I had received was that we were going to be a, uh, a feint from the south up into Ahla, and that we would, would expect, you know, minimal to no contact. And the, the direct words I was told was, it's going to be a walk in the park. Most of us were a little upset that, you know, we were brought all the way out here to, to be in a fake battle and we really wanted to go up to Karbala because that's where we thought the action was going to be. It was described to me as a walk in the park. We would move up towards Hilla and we'd be back in a few hours. There were supposedly some a few Fedayeen in the area but and we weren't really expecting a whole lot uh, at this battle. First light on the 31st of March, tanks of 270 armor set off in staggered columns towards Al Hila. The light infantry from the 101st Airborne Division rode exposed on the back of the tanks. Bringing up the rear were the scout and mortar platoons.
flying ahead of the convoy, looking for Iraqi positions, were heavily armed Apache attack helicopters. But just as they reached the city's outskirts, they came under intense anti-aircraft fire. This guy just erupted black poofs everywhere, and I just immediately flashed to Sunday afternoons watching World War II movies and the old bomber guys flying in, and I'm hit, Blackie, I'm hit, and the whole, the whole nine yards. I looked out my left window, and I saw a Fedeen guy standing in a courtyard of a building, and uh, he had a smoking RPG round, or launcher, and at that point, we got hit with the RPG, and our wingman came over the radio, RPG, RPG. It shredded through the, uh, through the belly of the aircraft and knocked out my radar altimeter. So we egressed that area at best possible speed, because uh, being inside of a cloud of uh, black smoke with flying hot metal is not exactly where you want to be. As soon as the Apaches were hit, the armored column came under fire. The tanks had effectively been ambushed by a large Iraqi force. I started noticing guys running around with AKs and, uh, and RPGs on their back. And at first, you know, I was, I was in disbelief. I was like, this can't be happening. So then it just started. We uh, started engaging RPG teams, which were approximately anywhere from 10 to 15 feet directly off to our right and left. It, the battle just began right then. The tank crews were sitting inside thick armor, but the infantry were exposed on the outside of it. I heard three or four rounds hit next to my foot. We just started laughing, because the initial was it's just really shock. Like, I can't believe we're actually getting shot at. And then suddenly, it just snapped like, wait a minute, this isn't funny. If we don't, that was really close. The scout and mortar platoons at the rear were the first to receive rocket-propelled grenade, or RPG hits, and effective Iraqi artillery fire. I saw the first volley come in. It was an RPG round. It hit right on the side of the scout vehicle, and a huge, enormous dust plume emanated from it. I immediately thought uh, that we'd lost a scout vehicle. I ain't gonna lie, I was, I, was, I was scared. I mean, I was freaked out, you know? A lot of us were the first time at war, and all the things I, I knew of war was what I seen in Hollywood movies, you know? I pretty much, I, I tried to stay calm, you know? 270 armor seemed outnumbered and outgunned by what turned out to be a trained Republican Guard division. Our thoughts of the enemy's competence was, was rising. Here we were at 270. We were loaded for bear and, and ready to go kick some ass. And now they got artillery and they got they're shooting at our helicopters, and they're shooting at our soldiers, and it all started to sink in. It was clear to me that we were up against something entirely different than uh, what we had uh, come across previously. It was very clear that this was a uh, professional, determined foe, uh, and that we had a long day ahead of us. I honestly thought we probably ran up against a battalion, because I was thinking to myself, oh boy, I think we screwed up here. These are a lot of guys out here. One tank on the right side of the road is firing, and all of a sudden, tanks on the left side starts picking up fire. You're like, oh man, there's a lot of people out here. The walk in the park was turning into a fully fledged battle. The first American casualty was one of the troops exposed on the back of the tanks. Specialist Brandon Rowe of the 101st Airborne was shot from a machine gun nest in a water tower. I looked over at him and seen him grab me for his chest. And I yelled to the medic, hey, man down, man down. We uh, took him off the tank, and uh, his body just became limp. The guy really just never had a chance. It was then that I just, with perfect clarity, just realized the magnitude of what had just happened and uh, the seriousness of what we were doing. He's a good kid. You know, usually I have a lot of anxious for these guys. 
and um, it's my job to be hard on them, to train them aggressively, make sure that they're prepared for, for anything that is thrown at them. They sucked that day because this kid, the last thing he said to me is, I'm shot. I had no answer for him. I got eyes on the, the machine gun nest in the tower that was uh, firing down on one of our other tanks. So I dropped down and uh, notified the crew about the tower and loaded an impact round and armed the main gun. But afterwards, I popped back up and it was cooked. It was toast. I mean, there was hardly anything left of that tower. Isolated in the belly of the tank, the driver, Jason Ramos, had a ringside seat of the battle. This is like playing PlayStation. I'm standing in the front. I get to see everything that's in front of me. While the gunner is just in the hole, he just, all he sees is this little circle thing. Even though we were kind of separate in the tank, and we all worked together. He was scan right, he was scan left, he just take him down. The turrets just moving left and right. You always constantly moving. At times, the fighting was at close quarters. I was still up in the turret when I noticed an RPG team consisting about five to six guys. I grabbed my uh, sidearm, my M9, nine millimeter pistol, and I fired uh, all three of my magazines, 45 rounds. I vividly remember seeing one of the soldiers actually go down, and he, he was shooting an RPG as I shot him. I only fired my pistol three times. I saw an RPG team. Shot one guy, it looked like his ear flew off. So I went for a body shot and he went down. And the other guy went for a body shot and he went down. At the rear, a civilian vehicle was attacking the column. The mortars that were on the highway were coming under fire from a white pickup truck, and I could see that it was loaded with a lot of people. And I could hear ricochets, and I could hear bullets, and that's when I gave the command to, to open fire on the truck. I saw three people pile out of the back, and they went into a ditch or, or the canal or whatever. What I seen next was pretty disturbing because what came out of the ditch was like two men and I'd say about five to six females. I remember this, uh, this one woman, she was holding a baby in her arms and she was, she was showing it, showing me the baby and the baby wasn't moving. And I thought, I thought, oh my God, we, uh, we shot this baby. And I remember my heart you know, dropped hit my feet and I thought boy I, I hope we didn't kill this baby and it started moving around and I kind of breathed a sigh of relief there so I was mad and I was upset that the first time I had to shoot during the war was towards a truck full of human shields and it was women and it was babies and it was old men that's the time that home feels the furthest away feels like you home so far away that you're probably never going to see it again. Heavy firepower slowly wore down the determined but poorly trained and ill-coordinated Iraqis. Desperately charging the tanks, they were mown down in their hundreds. It was probably about eight hours and uh, pretty much lasted all day. It was only uh, towards the sunset that it subsided substantially and we were only dealing with uh, limited resistance at that point, you know, onesies and twosies. My gunner says, hey, sir, I think I got a single troop running down the road. Range is about 1,200 meters. So I quickly jumped down, looked through my sight. I said, wit? I said, I think that's a dog. And I'm not sure. He goes, yeah, I can't tell either. I, th I think it's a troop. I think that's a weapon in his hands. 
And I said, okay. I said, go ahead and take the shot. 1,200 meters is fairly far for a machine gun. Uh, he let out a short burst, and uh, shortly after, a few seconds after the burst, he saw a dog go head over heels, uh, did about three somersaults. Um, and it's something that, uh, that bothered me, and I, I think it bothered him for a couple days. The armor and infantry had neutralized the opposition, but they had to come to terms with the loss of one of their men. I think that's when it hit us, you know. Sitting there with a platoon of guys crying. I mean, just uncontrolled. I mean, he just, that, that probably hurt. That hurt the most, just sitting there crying, knowing that we did everything that we could. We were prepared for it. We were ready for it, you know. It was just that one glitch. As they withdrew towards the south, the road behind them was littered with their day's work. It was at this point that we saw the full weight of what had happened, and it was just utter, utter devastation. Hundreds of bodies all over the road, and various forms of death, burnt, blown apart, bullet holes. I just remember the enormous stench of death. Something that uh, I'll never forget. By the 1st of April, the combat teams of the Army's 3rd Infantry Division were heading towards Baghdad from two different directions. The maneuver east of the Euphrates at Al-Hala had worked. The Iraqi army south of Baghdad appeared not to know where to concentrate its forces. Because we're coming on two different prongs, one east of the river with the Adhila, and us going through the Karbala Gap west of the river, he couldn't figure out where to commit his armor because as soon as he pulls them out from under the palm groves, they're going to get killed by the combined air forces and precision rockets and other things. With the Karbala Gap wide open, the army could speed most of its heavy armor through the gap and on towards the last obstacle on the march to Baghdad, the river crossing at the Euphrates. We now owned a significant piece of terrain, that gap, and the ability to press the rest of the coalition force through west of the Euphrates and strike directly at his weakness, which ultimately leads into the, into the heart of the regime itself, which is exactly what the whole point of maneuver warfare is. Move quickly when you can, accept decisive battle when you need to, but most importantly, strike the enemy where he is completely unprepared and doesn't have the ability to quickly adjust to the plan, and that's the whole point. On the morning of the 2nd of April, the 3rd Infantry Division fought their way to the banks of the Euphrates River. By the evening, they had captured the bridges at Karbala and Hindia, and under fire, crossed to the other side. For me, I, getting across the Euphrates, that was really the last place where we would be concentrating our forces to cross this one bridge that we needed to seize. And so when we were able to get our first tanks across, that really uh, was, a, to me, a, a decisive point that I, I knew we could get to Baghdad then and there wouldn't be anything he could do to, to stop us. So it's about uh, 20 hours from when we start this fight, we own the Euphrates River now and we're across and we're knocking on the door of Baghdad. In just two weeks, the U.S. Army and the Marine Corps had traveled 500 miles from Kuwait through southern Iraq towards Baghdad. Now they were poised south of the Iraqi capital for the final assault. But to end Saddam's regime, they would have to break into his stronghold. They would have to fight their way into Baghdad. From the enemy's perspective, there's no way that he had the command and control apparatus, the skill, or quite frankly, the force at hand to react to what we were doing. I mean, he's threatened in, all the way in the east by the Marines. He's threatened by us on east of Karbala by 3rd Brigade, on the river, across the river, and down into south of Baghdad and onto the airport. That's way too many fights.
the U.S. Army's 3rd Infantry Division led the attack. Its commander, Major General Buford Blunt, decided to strike at the heart of Saddam's regime by seizing two vital areas. Key pieces of the city uh, that I had identified um, and the Corps had identified for the, uh, for the division was the airport. It, as much political uh, statement as anything else. The other piece that we'd identified was the, uh, the downtown palace area, the government uh, seat that, uh, you know, where Saddam's home, the, the uh, government operated at. Those were the two key pieces of the city that I thought we needed to control. In Baghdad, a mixture of Special Republican Guard and determined but ill-trained militia prepared to defend the city. At the airport, Iraqi defenders dug in for an attack from the air, not suspecting that soldiers from the 1st Brigade combat team were rapidly closing in on them along the airport road. It's about 8 o'clock at night. It's dark, zero illumination, so there's no moon, no nothing. And all the lights in Baghdad are out that night. They're expecting vertical envelopment. Most everybody's gone to ground underneath, and that's where they live, is underground. At this point, it's almost pitch black as we begin the assault. My lead elements actually parallel the wall for a little bit as we were looking for a, a point of entry. We had expected, uh, upon our crashing through onto the airport, a, a, obviously a, a greeting from the, uh, the Iraqis in the form of obviously fire coming at us, uh, some type of uh, defense. It was very eerie because uh, once we got onto the airfield itself, everything was quiet. There was actually no fire uh, on us, so it was sort of a uh, very, almost a false sense of security uh, being on the base of the airfield. We really didn't have any contact until about, I would say, 4 o'clock, 4.30, once uh, uh, the sun started coming up and the Iraqis realized that we were right literally on top of them, and that's when uh, all hell broke loose. First light. That place came alive with fighters who came up out of the ground for morning prayer, and all of a sudden it's, you know, holy cow, where all these Americans come from? So thousands of firefights erupt all over that place. We start seeing all kinds of uh, hot spots. A lot of RPGs going off, a lot of the small arms fire, a lot of enemy trying to run and hide, just basically people popping up everywhere. They, they didn't know we were there until we were right on top of them. When the daylight, the sun started rising, it pretty much calmed down. At first, we were seeing 10 to 15 enemy troops at one time. Then it started slimming down. You might see five, then three. Then after a while, we, it, it just got quiet. Nobody was around anymore. Soldiers of 1st Brigade then got their first glimpse of the heart of Saddam's regime, a palace near the airport abandoned minutes before. My company was given the task to go clear uh, a couple of buildings in the palaces and include the uh, one palace, the actual uh, palace itself, which was uh, incredibly ornate, uh, incredibly uh, ostentatious. It was actually a marvel at uh, probably how to misspend uh, one's funds within the country. It was actually appalling to a degree. I mean, it was, it was both beautiful and uh, disgusting at the same time. And all of a sudden, we're in this palace-like thing, marble, glass, crystal, silver, beautiful Persian carpets. It's everything we had read about and all of a sudden we're there, and it's just absolutely unbelievable. Red phone, yep. I uh, captured a Syrian guy in a refrigerator in one of the palace kitchens. He said, hey, what are you doing here? He said, I'm here to defend the faith. A colonel, oh, subsequently we know, a special Republican Guards colonel, brought us out here, gave us weapons, told us to fight, the Americans are coming, and to, to defend and die for the faith. And then he left. Over the next 24 hours, Iraqis counterattacked. Attacks which were ferocious but ineffective, sometimes with improvised weapons. I mean, people on a, a 250cc motorcycle with a recoilless rifle mounted on a sidecar shooting in an M1 tank. Well, it's never going to win. Not today, not tomorrow, not ever. 50 guys with AKs right in the back of a cargo truck taking on a fighting vehicle that can shoot and kill them at two kilometers direct fire. They're never going to win, but they do it over and over and over again. The airport was now in the hands of U.S. forces, but the regime was still maintaining that the Americans were being defeated. 
We crushed the forces in Saddam International Airport, and we cleaned the whole place of the airport. Now the Republican Guard is in full control of Saddam International Airport. Okay, good job, all right. I felt a, a huge sense of accomplishment on behalf of the, the brigade combat team, certainly, but I think the division, because that's the first regime icon to fall. Now, obviously, I, I'm not sleeping really easily yet, but we're, we're where we were supposed to be, and we knew the regime's on its heels. The Marines, meanwhile, had taken the southeastern route to Baghdad to confuse Iraqi forces about the direction of the main attack. They'd met resistance the whole way, more like ambushes than the coordinated engagements they had planned for. We expected a modern battlefield. We expected thousands of artillery pieces, thousands of tanks, tens of thousands of, of uh, soldiers. Um, we expect to take casualties. The platoons and the companies were having platoon and company size engagements just like it has always been. You got a sniper in the tower behind you! And it was inch by inch, it was foot by foot, it was just like uh, World War II stuff. They were jumping into fighting positions and in, in putting bayonets in folks. Uh, and that's as high intensity as it gets for any soldier or any Marine. They were ready to attack Baghdad from the east. But to get there, they would have to cross the Diyala River, a narrow waterway so insignificant that it had not even been mentioned in briefings. If you look in Iraq, the thing that sticks out is the Mesopotamian plain and the boundaries of that, which are the Euphrates, which is a big honking river, and the Tigris, which is a big honking river. Those stick out to everybody who looks at a map. And then we got to the Diala, and this little doggone, you know, creek reinforced had no crossing sites. And so here we were, had crossed all these major obstacles, and we're kind of slowed down and faced with a situation that we, we quite frankly didn't want. And the helicopter reconnaissance reports uh, told us that the bridges were blown. As we moved up towards our bridge, we noticed uh, a large flow of uh, not so much refugees, but I would say looters, and they were hauling refrigerators. I saw a John Deere tractor or two, forklifts. Uh, they were all heading south, and I said, boy, if, they, if they're moving south, they, they must have crossed the bridge somehow. As we moved up onto the bridge, uh, it was in fact blown. It had a large uh, crater put in uh, the middle of one of the spans and it was unpassable to, to any of our large vehicles. The Marines halted, waiting to cross the river and join the fight in Baghdad. It was the moment that the engineers had trained for. They brought forward equipment of Vietnam vintage to try and bridge the gap. We're coming up to the river, and I had to go to a small briefing from this lieutenant. And what he told me was, Basically, we're going to use our vehicle and lay down an additional support of a bridge on top of one. Our job is basically just get up there, lay it down in a swift, safe, orderly manner, and inspect it just to make sure when these 70-ton tanks go over that the bridge is going to collapse. And that, that's our job. young sergeant operating it. I don't even know if he, he knew how critical what he was doing. Uh, he got out and inspected his work. Uh, I remember even without his helmet. I remember us all yelling at him, put your helmet on for God's sake. And meanwhile, you know, people shooting all over the place, but I thought it was us shooting at them. In turn, I found out it was them shooting at us. My vehicle was the first vehicle to go over there. It, it was pretty rough. It was scary because your tracks are so far apart and you don't know if, you're, if your vehicle's gonna make it over that big bridge. And, you know, you don't know where to go or which way to turn, but you know what, just drive forward and go over and hope you just don't fall. I remember seeing a, a, a big rocket. I don't know what it was, but uh, it, was, it was pretty big. And I was like, thank God that thing didn't get fired at us. That's one thing I remember. So that northern bridge 
turned out to be a gold mine for us in terms of giving us the, the ability and the flexibility to maneuver on Baghdad. So now we took part in something a little bit bigger than the average man. You know, and even though we thought it was nothing, someone up there, the higher ups, you know, the, those who control things, they see that we did something great. So, I mean, for me, it felt really good. With Baghdad Airport taken, U.S. Army tanks massed to the south. For months, planners had argued about how to take Baghdad. Accepted military doctrine stated it would take infantry with tanks and support. Major General Blunt's plan challenged that. He wanted tanks alone to storm through Baghdad from the south to meet friendly forces at the airport. It was a lightning maneuver to test Baghdad's defenses. It became known as the Thunder Run. Then we wanted to uh, really find out what he was going to do in the city, how he was going to defend the city. We hadn't actually gone into the city yet. We had the outside secured. Uh, we didn't, and we knew there was still uh, about a tank battalion's worth of tanks that uh, the Special Republican Guards had that we had not, uh, not destroyed yet. Uh, we didn't know where those were. And we knew they were, he was going to defend the city uh, in some detail, but we didn't know how, how hard he was going to fight. The plan of urban warfare with tanks took the soldiers of 164 Armor, part of 3rd Infantry Division, by surprise. On April 4th, the night we got the order, our company commander called all the platoon leaders and platoon sergeants in for a little huddle around his Humvee. And he explained that we're going to go and we're going to do the thing that none of us thought we were going to do. We are going to take tanks through the center of Baghdad. And we all kind of looked at each other. The one mission we thought we'd never see, we were going to do. When we first got the word, we were a little scared. We were anxious, we were excited, because that's what we came to do. And then we asked the brigade intelligence officer, what's the enemy situation we can expect? And he honestly had no idea. We started cleaning our machine guns, linking up ammo, doing um, before operations checks, you know, make sure everything was ready to go. The real intent was to show the enemy, we're here and we can do this. We can get through the city. We're not afraid to fight you in the cities because the Iraqi were, were convinced and that was their propaganda party line that we wouldn't fight him in the cities, that we couldn't win in the cities. On the 5th of April, the tanks of 164 Armor set off from the southern edge of Baghdad for the first thunder run into the city. We just rolled onto this eight-lane highway with, with these tanks, and the traffic was still going. It was like the middle of the day, so the traffic was normal and uh, you saw cars swerving around the tanks and everything like that. Looking back on it, it was, it, was, um, it was really a sight. It was such a sight that one soldier took some photos of the assault into Baghdad from the turret of his tank. I remember coming over the radio saying to my wingman, um, how are we gonna get through this traffic? And all I heard was uh, this 10-year veteran from the Army saying, don't worry, I got it. He just gave us some gas and went straight on into the traffic. Meanwhile in Baghdad, Republican guards, irregular Iraqi troops, and foreign fighters, surprised by the approaching convoy, scrambled to defend the city at overpasses and road junctions with shoulder-launched RPGs, rocket-propelled grenades. The Iraqis had positions all the way on that road, RPGs, anti-aircraft guns, artillery pieces, some BMPs, even some tanks. We countered contact. The entire route was literally a gauntlet. This truck came to our right side, and uh, it was uh, two guys in the truck, a little white, like maybe Toyota or something, and uh, it started engaging my tank commander with a, uh, with a pistol. And in return, my tank commander encountered with a uh, little fire from his M4 uh, carbine, and uh, he killed the driver, and the passenger tried to grab, grab the wheel. And, uh, and as they came up past us, my tank commander said, uh, engage him. And so we turned the turret around, and we let him have with all the machine guns that we had, and uh, just demolished the truck. Watching that technical go up like that, it was just, uh, it's just the sound of our power. The 
thing that's hard about Urban is they have a lot of places to hide. And uh, their tactics was wait till we pass by and then to engage us. It was pretty much uh, a lesson on, on the go. The Thunder Run was going as planned when intense, well-aimed fire threatened to disrupt the whole maneuver. As we cleared the first uh, overpass, the elite elements fought their way through there. It was a pretty tough fight, but we kept moving. The trail tank company had one of their tanks hit. The RPG penetrated into the engine compartment and started a fire. We had to stop. We didn't want to abandon the vehicle unless we had to. We spent uh, probably 30 minutes, because every time we thought the fire was out, the vehicle would catch fire again. And as we were there, the company was constantly being attacked. The lead tank crews continued with their assault, not realizing that the rear of the column had stopped behind the stricken tank. At the command post, General Blunt watched the drama unfold on a satellite tracking system. I could see that there was a break in the column. I was talking to the brigade commander, and uh, you know he had reported they had a tank uh, that had caught fire, and that, that you know that was what was causing the break. I was really concerned about the separation in the column, where they had that uh, you know about a two-kilometer gap there that had developed as that one tank uh, went down. You could see um, Saddam's forces, the Special Republican Guard as well as the Fedayeen crawling up the back streets ahead of us. These fights were 100 meters, 50 meters. I knew in some cases, uh, 10 feet. We began to describe the enemy as determined yet stupid. These guys would literally come right at you. It was a bit unnerving. It's not something we expected. And we didn't expect that kind of fanaticism from the Ba'ath Party. As the Thunder Run headed to the safety of the airport, one of the tank commanders was fatally wounded. As we got close to the airport, the resistance got stiffer. And that's because the Iraqis had expected the main attack to come from the airport. And here we came in behind them. I think the magic moment for us is when we saw the friendly forces at the Baghdad airport. Once we got onto that solid ground, um, that was definitely a, a momentous moment, so to speak. Major Donovan took photos of the scene on the airport's runway in the aftermath of the battle. It was a very emotional time. I mean, it was uh, the uh, uh, you know decision to do the movement was mine. They pulled into the airport there, and I met them, and you know, they down, you know, they had been, uh, been a pretty tough fight. Uh, every, every vehicle had been hit by some type of fire, small arms or RPGs or artillery. Um, you know, we lost, uh, lost one of our tank commanders in that fight. Uh, had, had two or three other soldiers uh, wounded uh, badly, and so we got them out medically. But I went around and talked to all the soldiers, and that was important for me to see the impact that, that, that it had and what shape they were in. Uh, that was the first time we really lost any of our soldiers, so it's it kind of an eerie feeling amongst us, very solemn atmosphere. I looked around, and all these 18-year-old kids that we just took on a ride uh, for, for their life, of their life, um, had a thousand-mile stare, so to speak. The battalion commander had come up to me, and he said, uh, how you doing? And I said, sir, I, I'm doing about as well as can be expected. And he goes, well, good, because we're probably going to go back in tomorrow. And at that point in time, I think uh, my stomach went into knots. It was gut-wrenching, thinking that we would have to go through there again. 24 hours later, 164 Armor skirted around Baghdad and went back into the city along the same route as the first Thunder Run. But this time, they wouldn't turn west towards the airport. They would head into the heart of Baghdad and stay there. If you can hit them fast and furious, and what we call a stern up the hornet's nest, once you could swat all those hornets down, they usually broke their back of resistance. And then after that, you just deal with limited attacks. We just charged in there into downtown Baghdad, got set, got in position, and they were never strong enough to push us out. That's where we're going. 
My platoon was the first platoon to go through Saddam Hussein's uh, VIP viewing stands. That's the famous saber arch that you see in Baghdad on all pictures. It's a little weird crossing it because that's you know that's where Saddam stood watching his armor formations, and there we are, minus Saddam, of course. We wish he was there, but obviously he wasn't. And you can tell that's where he'd stand up there and watch his army go by or whatever. It was a pretty nice feeling. It's kind of like being uh, on uh, Pennsylvania Avenue in Washington, D.C., you know, all the monuments. That's what it felt like. Well, one thing I, I do remember was going down to the parade field in downtown Baghdad after we seized that, uh, you know, the big, uh, where the cross sabers are and going under the sabers uh, where the, you know, and going up to where Saddam had stood and watched all the parades uh, go by. That was uh, very meaningful to me. We had a couple of cigars saved up for just the occasion, and we went ahead and smoked those that night. During that day, tanks rolled into the heart of Baghdad and onto the bridges crossing the Tigris. The Iraqi regime refused to acknowledge that Saddam's hold on the city was now collapsing. They pushed a few of their armored carriers and some tanks with their, with their soldiers. We besieged them and we killed most of them, and I think we will finish them soon. We will slaughter them all. Those invaders, their tombs will be here in Iraq. Tanks cleared enemy bunkers along the main routes and the banks of the river. The pictures of fleeing Iraqi soldiers went round the world, part evidence that U.S. forces were now in Baghdad. But if the army wanted to consolidate their move into the city, they needed to keep a supply route open. Over the next 24 hours, a major battle erupted along Highway 8, the road which headed back to U.S. forces south of the city. The road was the army's lifeline. If they could keep it open, they would be able to resupply with regular convoys. The intent behind it was if we could stay one night, we could stay two nights. Um, if we could stay two nights, we could stay three. One of the convoy supply vehicles was hit, and the fire spread to four other vehicles. But gradually, the American superior firepower wore down the city's defenders. Many of them turned out to be Syrians who crossed into Iraq to fight the Americans. After 10 hours of intense fighting, 15 vehicles loaded with fuel and ammunition ran the gauntlet and reached the center of Baghdad. We controlled Baghdad when we were able to do that. I mean, that's, the Marines had not uh, gotten in yet, but we were, you know, we were secured on, on the, uh, had the west side of the city, uh, that part of it secured. Well, that was our final objective, you know, for the division, so we had reached our objective there. The Diyala River had held up the Marines, but on the 8th of April, they rolled into Baghdad from the east. In the case of Baghdad, as of all the built-up areas in, in Iraq, we didn't really want to go into them because we thought it would be uh, drawn out and, and nasty and bloody, quite frankly. So going into Baghdad, we were a little hesitant. We were confident in our weapon systems, but what was the enemy going to do? Was he going to take pot shots at us from buildings? Were we going to have to uh, cause a lot of what we would call collateral damage? I'm going to be destroying the homes of innocents, killing the innocent civilians. What is the price we're going to pay uh, to take down Baghdad? The price would become apparent later. But on that day, the Marines drove straight into Firdaus Square in the city center on the east bank of the Tigris. What happened next? became the symbolic end of Saddam's regime. I had noticed that uh, there was a statue that was in the middle of the uh, square. So I had radioed my uh, executive officer, and I said, uh, sir, I got this statue over here. Can we go knock it down? And he goes, uh, no, Gunny, that's not what we're here for. And I said, roger that, sir. So we, we sat there for a little bit, and then uh, the next thing you know, the, the square started filling up with uh, a lot of Iraqi civilians. And uh, one of the Iraqi civilians had walked up to uh, myself at the Mike 88, and he asked me if we could help him 
take down a statue. And when I relayed what my company commander had said, that that was not what we was here for, he asked for equipment to do it himself. So I gave him a long piece of rope and a sledgehammer, gave him what I could provide so they could do it themselves. So we sat there and watched him struggle with it for a while uh, before my company commander, Captain Lewis, came up to the 88. He says, uh, Gunny, I want you to prepare to help them take down this statue on my order. I said, Roger that, sir. As we were moving the 88 up to pull the, the statue down, I had a young uh, Iraqi civilian male kept asking me over and over and over again for an American flag. This teenager, as teenagers oftentimes are, is persistent. And after I sent him to about three or four people trying to find an American flag, he came back with Lieutenant McLaughlin's American yeah. flag. And he said, OK, basically in, in broken English, I've got the American flag. And he pointed up on the statue. And uh, finally, I was like, OK, give me the flag. Yeah. I gave it to Sergeant Sutherland. I said, run this thing up top and then pull it back down and we'll put in an Iraqi flag. We'll go right up after. We had Corporal Chen, who was from New York, go ahead and place the flag up on, on top. Not as a sort of saying that we're here to, uh, that we conquered anything, but this is what you're going to get if, uh, if you mess with the United States and you support terroristic acts. We're here to take down Saddam and his regime. The media version is that a U.S. commander ordered the flag to come down. Nevertheless, the Iraqi flag went up soon afterwards. And they were very insistent yeah. about which Iraqi flag, flag went back up, up. Yeah. because apparently uh, Saddam had made a change to the Iraqi flag, and he had uh, added some words, uh, some words to it. And the flag that they wanted to see on top of the statue was the old Iraqi national flag that did not have the, the writing on it. There was a, uh, an Iraqi civilian with a British accent, and uh, he had one of his shoes in his hand. And he's standing right in front of the 88. And the guy is 6'3 or 6'4, uh, thin Iraqi civilian with a British accent, starts hopping up and down and screaming, I bloody will not uh, expletive, calm down, and he's hitting the uh, statue with one hand. So we're really dealing with uh, some raging emotions from a lot of the civilians that were yes, there. He was. wanted that statue to come down. He broke into tears uh, shortly after that, talking about what the regime had done to him and his family. And he, he want, that was a symbol of the regime, and they wanted it to go away. Some of the Iraqi uh, citizens, which were uh, beating it with the soles of their shoes, which is uh, one of the biggest disgraces, I guess, that they can uh, bestow upon a person. They actually cut off his head and drug it around the street with a chain. Uh, that whole day was very strange. It was uh, totally different than anything that we'd experienced during the war up to that point. But uh, I think there was a nagging feeling in the back of all of my minds that uh, there was plenty left to do. The army coming from the west and the marines from the east now had central Baghdad under their control. So we've already talked about just that MPFI. Colonel Joseph Dunford, commanding Regimental Combat Team 5, told his men that the fight for Baghdad wasn't over. And, uh, and if you want to talk about enemy, Someone's going to have to argue with me pretty hard that uh, anybody since uh, Vietnam fighting the North Vietnamese has confronted an enemy that was this determined. Now, Colonel Dunford was put in charge of an operation aimed at finishing off the regime for good. Saddam's statue had come down. But somewhere in North Baghdad, the man himself was still at large. I think about 24 hours, maybe less, prior to us uh, being assigned to go into that particular portion of Baghdad, we got the word that Ben Saddam Hussein sighting, uh, as well as some of his senior officials. North Baghdad was still pretty much intact, and nobody had really attacked into it. And this was into a part of the city, which stronghold one of his palaces, into a place that no one else had gone. We knew something was up because we had uh, special forces with us, and that's the first time we had them with us the uh, whole trip. So 
eventually, you know, word got passed down a little bit, trickled down to us that we were going to take a, a palace in Baghdad, and that's all we knew. Early in the morning on April 10th, Alpha, Bravo, and Charlie companies of 1-5 Marines left their base in the north and headed south down Route 2, intending to turn west towards the last remaining Saddam stronghold, the Azamaya Palace. The hunt for Saddam was on. Just as we came into Baghdad and we were taking a few rounds, there was a, a small pickup truck or car just off of the side of the road. And as soon as we got level with that, an RPG hit it or something happened to it and it exploded. Kind of lifted the track that we were traveling in up on its side and then the thing weighs 26 tons so it was a pretty hefty explosion. It knocked me down into the bottom of the track, uh, knocked my driver's helmet off and you just saw this big huge orange fireball. All of a sudden we're moving and then the next thing you know that we're stopped. And then uh, all hell broke loose. All of a sudden, RPG and heavy machine gun and medium machine gun fire erupted all around us. And we're just pretty much getting shot on from everywhere, from all directions, especially up top. Muzzle flashes, every building, every little bunker, uh, RPGs hitting tracks left and right. There was just RPGs, bullets. You can hear the bullets whizzing right by your head. The RPGs flying right by your head, literally. Yeah. All I remember hearing is uh, RPGs hitting the wall. The big booms, and you know those were just aimed at you or people outside there. That's when it kind of hit that, man, this is pretty serious. Not a single track in that convoy didn't get shot at with an RPG. It was the biggest drive-by you could ever imagine, and it was just the most amazing light show I've ever seen in my life. On the way to the palace, the convoy took a wrong turn and drove back into the ambush. The maps we had didn't have the accuracy we needed, so as we were supposed to take the right turn, there was actually three right turns, a real sharp right turn, a narrow, and then just a kind of a yield over to the right. And the platoon commander uh, did the best he could, and I uh, ended up turning the wrong route, which caused a lot of confusion. And we had to turn the whole entire battalion around and go through the ambush again. You start seeing the same buildings over and over, like we're going around in a big circle. Go get that gun up. And you're trying to think to yourself, well, what's going on? Are we going to the palace? Or are we just driving around in a circle right now? Bravo Company managed to break away from the convoy and found its own way to the palace. We fired a couple of Mark 19 rounds at the gates. The gates were probably 10 to 10 feet high, and they were, you know, heavy iron gates. Didn't do anything to the gates. And I had some engineers attached with me, and they offered to go, you know, set up some demolitions and blow the gates off. But it was going to take about 20 minutes to do, and I knew we didn't have 20 minutes. YXO jumped out of his track and uh, was talking to the engineers and saw that there was an open like a pedestrian gate off to one of the sides. He just went in there and saw that nobody was in the palace and came around and opened the gates for us. So that's how we ended up getting in there. Not necessarily the textbook example of how to breach, but it worked for us. Marines from Bravo Company established a command base at the palace. They deployed sniper teams on the roof to watch for potential threats. And you've seen more and more civilian uh, vehicles driving by, cars coming up. There was uh, one Pacific time, the uh, shooter was kept asking me as a spotter, hey, does that guy got anything? Does that guy got anything? Give me a reason. It just looked suspicious. There was a lot of car bombs going on and actually suicide bombers just walking up and the next thing you know, boom, the guy's a red mist. As Charlie and Alpha arrived to join Bravo inside the palace, they got an urgent change of objective. The search for Saddam was heating up. He'd been sighted again at a nearby mosque. As the day went on, uh, the intelligence was coming in that they were in a variety of different locations. And when we actually went in, uh, we went in specifically uh, to those locations where we thought Saddam Hussein and some of his senior leadership were. Charlie was sent to a nearby Ba'ath Party stronghold, Alpha to the neighboring Imam Mosque. 
When I was told that Saddam Hussein could potentially be our objective, I took it as any other mission, and I really, you know, my heart rate didn't change at all that Saddam Hussein could potentially be there. I won't say that I was skeptical, but you know, when I saw Saddam Hussein in front of me, then I would have said, okay, I got Saddam Hussein. But until, until I saw him, I really wasn't gonna get excited about it. We then went down a very narrow alleyway, and we could see the mosque in the distance. Again, we were in a very hairy position, going through an avenue, which our tanks could not employ their weapon systems. We were basically knocking over back porches and, and all kinds of stuff for the housing as we were going through these alleys. As we wrapped around the mosque, we were facing a platoon-sized force, probably around 30 guys or so inside the mosque, and a company-sized force around the mosque, which I would estimate about 100 guys or so were around the mosque. As we approached about a block or so from the mosque, the tank platoon uh, that was attached to the company was ambushed and Lieutenant Patrick's tank was hit with an RPG and immobilized. And we quickly set up security around him and we allowed him to switch tanks. So it was a pretty, pretty ballsy move by him to, to leave his tank under fire from the enemy and switch out and uh, continue to fight with his tank platoon. This whole time, there's, we're, we're in the middle of a heavy firefight. Like, they're just shooting at us from everywhere. And I, I've counted, like, there was at least, like, hundreds of RPGs being shot at us. I, I said, they probably have more RPGs than they do bullets. There was a white puff of smoke I saw, and then I saw the rocket coming at my head. Just got bigger, 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 and then kind of caught it and went past me and exploded right next to me on, t on the uh, top of the, the armored vehicle. And uh, felt like somebody hit me across the face with a baseball bat. I don't know where it came from or how it happened, but uh, I was hit in the head with a RPG. I literally got my bell rung. Couldn't hear anything, didn't really know where I was or what happened. Just one minute, we're taking fire, I'm returning fire, and the next minute I'm in somebody's lap at the bottom of the track. And I saw blood just gushing out of my face, and that's when it put me into a pretty deep, deep shock. They passed over the net that I was dead. Called my friends and everything told me that they heard I was dead. It's kind of disconcerting a little bit, but it's still here, so it's good. Then I realized I was alive too, which kind of had a kind of a weird, I was elated to be alive. On the other hand, I was secretly, I was afraid that I might pass away, but it was getting to the point where if it happens, it happens. Got pretty upset, pretty mad. How dare them fire at me? hit me, uh, put all my gear back on, sit up and continue on with the fight. I knew that we had casualties from the RPG shots. The tank was obviously immobilized. One of our tracks was immobilized with an RPG shot. And it was just a matter of how many Marines were gonna come back alive when it was over. Charlie, meanwhile, approached the Bath Party stronghold. My company commander called me over and he had uh, his radio and he had his GPS out on his map and he said, we have a 10 digit grid of where Saddam's body is. It was believed that Saddam was in the area and that he was killed by the civilians. He tasked my, uh, my squad, my platoon, with finding the body. So he had a 10 digit grid and I'd break out my map and go to look for it and we were pretty, pretty damn excited. I mean, that would be one hell of a story to tell if I was the one that found Saddam's body. So we cleared uh, three to five city blocks, it's tough to remember. When we were uh, when we were clearing through, most of the, most of the people were were extremely frightened. One particular house at the end, though, we had uh, found a whole entire family, and it's kind of sad because the whole family came in and they got on their knees, and there was a little girl, maybe five years old, and she was on her knees, and I was trying to have them stand up because you know I knew they were civilians, there was no threat, and I had them all on a corner anyway, and I'd say there was about 12 of them, and they were all on their knees, and I pulled out some Iraqi money, and I was you know pointing to the Saddam's face and say, is he in this area? Have you seen him? Have you heard anything? And uh, and I told him, I said he's dead, but we need to find his body. And as soon as I said that, everyone jumped up, and they were all yelling and all happy and screaming, and uh, they were trying to offer us water and food, and uh, they were just they were just so much joy, and they were shaking our hands and, and you know they wanted to dance with us and we, you know we had to keep on moving keep on searching through all these buildings it was now late morning bravo was setting up the battalion's command post in the palace charlie was clearing the bath party stronghold and alpha was involved in an intense firefight at the mosque 
Now over the radio, Bravo could hear the chaos at the mosque. Casualties began to pour in, and the battalion already had its first KIA, killed in action. Gunnery Sergeant Bohr was the one KIA that we had that day. We knew about him as it happened. And then casualty reporting would come in the following days because Marines who were injured didn't want anybody to know that they were injured for fear of being evacuated out. CH-46s were flying in and out, picking up casualties, dropping off ammunition as they went in and out. It, it, was, it was truly pretty phenomenal across the board. Alpha had now surrounded the mosque, but there was fierce resistance. Under increasingly heavy fire, the Marines asked for air support. At this point, we got permission to start using our combined arms and start using our aircraft and our artillery, and we called in A-10s to run strikes against the, the companies outside of the mosque. Air Force came by and they dropped the 1,000-pound bomb. When they did that, it felt like the earth was in, like a, like in the ocean for a few minutes. That was pretty cool. Comes another eight ten strike. Okay, 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 okay. At first, you didn't know what it was, what was going on. You're seeing this building getting destroyed, and you hear something. And it sounds like a huge machine gun, and then you look up, and there's the A ten. I think everybody was screaming and yelling. It, it was motivating. Marines stormed the mosque to eliminate any remaining resistance. There's a huge courtyard. There's marble floors, and there's a, just elegant gardens everywhere. And then you, I look to the far side, and there's just a machine gun laying down there. I can hear explosions from inside, them using uh, explosives to boat open the doors, gunfire, yelling, screaming. And when we got there, it was just a massive chandelier on the roof, there's huge doors, and there's a, a, a giant stairway going down. Someone else from my team went through, and he was searching around, and he st uh, some carpets on the ground. He and stepped, stepped on, on this carpet. guy. It scared the hell out of him. And we're tr trying to talk to this guy, and. All he's saying is America's great down with Saddam, America's great down with Saddam. And he's trying to kiss me on the cheek and I'm trying to push him away. We had these little cards that have these uh, Iraqi language on it and how to pronounce it. I said, tell everybody to come up from downstairs. And he said something in Arabic, nothing happened. I said, uh, tell them we won't harm them if they come up. And he said it in Arabic and nothing happened. And so I was getting, a, my patience was wearing a little thin, so I said, Tell them we're going to come down there and kill them off. They don't come up right now. And uh, he said that, and not 10 seconds later, 20 guys came running up from downstairs. We pretty much rounded them up all together, tied them up with a curtain, ripped it up, and utilized the curtain to tie them all together, and uh, walked them out there one by one right in the middle of all this. They pretty much gave up in there. They knew they were beat. From the perspective of the uh, Lance Corporals and on up to the company commander, I, I think that it was about as intense a fight as, uh, as you're going to face. I mean, it had all the elements. It had fog, it had friction, it had uncertainty, it had uh, imminent danger to each one of those individuals. And uh, with the complexity of being in an urban environment, and, uh, and that's what they were confronted with. There's all these cases of near catastrophic incidents that somehow we avoided I don't know if it was sheer luck or, or what it was. After eight hours of intense fighting, one five Marines reunited at the palace. One Marine had been killed and over 80 wounded. But hundreds of Iraqis had been killed and captured. Innocent civilians had also been caught in the crossfire. The Marines controlled North Baghdad, but the big prize had evaded them. The fact that Saddam wasn't there didn't really mean anything to me. I, I was just doing my job, and if he was there, he was there. I was in no way uh, at a sense of loss of mission accomplishment because he was not there. We still went there and captured critical Ba'ath Party members uh, and, and got our mission accomplished. The Marines came away without Saddam, but the strategic significance of the battle was enormous. All of Baghdad was now under coalition control. I've described that particular day as my uh, worst day uh, of the war and my best day of the war. My worst day because of the intensity of fighting and the numbers of casualties that we took. But my best day, and this is where I think that particular day was of significance, at least to RCT-5 and frankly I think to the, to the entire war, 
despite the ferocity of the fighting on the way into the city, but what I was confronted with about six or seven hours after the fighting stopped when I drove back out north of the city was spontaneously thousands of people uh, coming out to cheer us and to thank us for what we had done. And it was at that particular time, I think, that every Marine that was out there understood that what we had done was liberate a people. I think it also uh, signified a transition for us from regular combat operations into security and stability operations. I mean, it happened almost immediately. And the transition in terms of our relationship with the people and the methods that we would use to accomplish the mission changed on that particular day. But it wasn't that simple. Coalition troops, like the soldiers of 270 Armor, who'd fought their way through Iraq, expected to be home within months of the end of the war. But one year on, they were still in Baghdad. I have one daughter. She'll be two years old in February, which means uh, I will have missed the second year of her life. Since I've been gone, she's got teeth. She's learned how to talk, walk, run, crawl. You missed all this? Yes, and uh, I'm sure I'll miss much more. Within months of the fall of Saddam's regime, the number of coalition soldiers killed in security operations exceeded the number of those killed during the initial push for Baghdad. U.S. forces were suddenly required to fulfill a double role. Two nights ago, yes. there was an attack, a yes. mortar attack yes. on the what that company tank? mortar. Everybody's wondering, hey, is, is, does, does that box over here, does that bush over there have a bomb in it with my name on it. It's, it's very troubling for many of the soldiers, myself included. He asked uh, the sound of the bomb. He asked where, I don't know. To go from kill everything you see to, uh, hey, keep the peace. You're police officers now. A lot of people don't know how to turn the switch in their heads. So where, where are the bombs? No. They've gone through the war, they've been shot at, they've, they've seen their buddies wounded. It's a challenge because they've never been trained to restrain that violence. It's always been apply more violence. In just three weeks, a lean, mobile force with superior technology and aggressive tactics toppled Saddam Hussein's regime in a campaign which cost the lives of 152 coalition troops and thousands of Iraqis. During those three weeks, there were clues as to what would happen once Saddam was gone. Coalition forces faced an unpredictable and determined enemy in a battle with no clear end.